to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ toward the end of the book of judges we are told a very important key about the problems that keep rising up. The Bible says in Judges 21, 25, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. If you ever want to see anarchy at work, the book of Judges deals with that a great bit. And so we encourage you today, if you haven't got your Bible out, to locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to be studying the book of Judges today. As always, we welcome you to our study together. We're so glad that you've joined us and we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by individuals and church congregations of the Churches of Christ. Friend, we want to encourage you today to uh, check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. There are a lot of good study information is found on our website. We have free CDs and DVDs that we make available to you. You can visit our website, fill out our media request form, or you can call us or write to us, and we've got a, a large host of Bible study material that would be beneficial to you. Also, we have all our information available for download, both audio and video, from our website, as well as transcripts, study questions, articles. Check it out and see if that won't be uh, helpful for you in your Bible study. Also, don't forget to download our app from the Play Store, both the Google Play Store and the Android, uh, the Apple Play Store as well, have those available. And that's a great way to study the Word of God uh, in your own time on the go with your smartphone. And then, of course, we want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. The Church of Christ would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, uh, whether it be for Bible study, worship, maybe their Wednesday evening Bible study. They'd be happy for you to stop by and visit them. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to study more about God or the church or the plan of salvation, they'd be happy to help you with that. Friend, today we're thinking about a very dark time, probably some of the darkest days in Israel's history are found in the book of Judges. There are some very important keys to help us understand what's going on in this book. As we mentioned, the, the key idea to the ultimate downfall into these dark days in Israel's history is found in Judges 17.6 and Judges 21, 25. The Word of God records this for us. In those days, in the days of the judges, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It isn't just the fact that Israel was living in an anarchist society, that is, that everybody was their own law unto themselves. But did you hear that statement at the first of Judges 21, 25? In those days, there was no king in Israel. Friend, the problem is not that they didn't have a human king. The problem is Israel had tried to dethrone God. Not even God was their king anymore. They were living immorally. They were living like many times the heathen nations around them. Oftentimes they would uh, get freedom from their oppressors and their lives will begin to be blessed and they'll forget about God. And they're living, they're living a life without God is the problem. God is not at the center anymore and thus they're living for their own selfish desires. Key words would be anarchy and confusion. They are confused and often oppressed by their enemy, enemies because they're living a life of anarchy. One of the key verses is also found in Judges 2 verse 10. The Bible says that the death of Joshua, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. That 
command that God gave His people in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 following, to set God's laws, God's teaching, God's principles before their children, they didn't follow up with that well. And thus a generation arises that does not know God or the works of God. The, 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 the ten plagues that brought them out of Egypt. God carrying them over into the promised land. God completely vanquishing all their enemies for them. This generation doesn't know God, and as a result, there is a great cycle of sin that is going to occur. In fact, that's one of the big things in the book of Judges, is you've got this continuous cycle of sin that happens over and over again uh, throughout the book. For example, God's people will have a time of great freedom, where they're in happiness and peace and everything's going well. In this time of freedom and when they're blessed, they will then forget about God. When they forget about God, they will fall into a, a state of apostasy, living without God. As a result, God will allow their enemies to come over and oppress them and sometimes even take them captive. Eventually, and sometimes it takes 30, 40, or more years, they will realize, hey, this, is, this suffering's happening to us because we have forgot about God. As a result, they will then turn to God in repentance. They'll change their ways. They'll amend their lives, and God will send a deliverer. That deliverer in the book of Judges is called a judge. And so when they repent and come back to God, leave their apostasy, God sends them a judge or a deliverer, and they'll be for a period of time uh, freedom and peace and blessedness again in their life until they begin to forget God again. And this cycle happens about 14 or 15 times in the book of Judges. Over and over again, during this period of Israel's history, they forget about God so many times. And so what do we learn from the book of Judges? What are some practical lessons we can learn from this book that will help a Christian, not living in the time of the Old Testament, but will help me and you, help us to live faithful to God? Friend, one of the great lessons that we will learn from the book of Judges is obedience to God always brings blessings. As we look to the people of God in the book of Judges, as long as they are following God, as long as they're doing the will of God, and as long as they're staying humble and penitent in the sight of God, their lives are completely blessed. Every time in the book of Judges, when they will come out of sin and turn back to God, their lives are blessed beyond measure because they're following God and living according to His will. Friend, you see that so much throughout the book of Judges, and it's such a practical lesson for us today. We need to realize the importance of following God and how our lives will be blessed just as well. Jesus taught us that we need to obey God. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9 says, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. And friend, as we think about Christ's words, in Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up to heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And friend, when we decide we're going to obey God, blessed are those who keep His law, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, Matthew 5, verses 4 through 6, our lives are going to be spiritually blessed beyond measure. The more I draw near to God, the happier, the more peace, and the more joy I'm going to have in my life, especially spiritually speaking. But now, flip that coin over. In every time in the book of Judges that Israel fell away from God or got caught up with the heathen nations or the world around them or became involved in idolatry, friend, there was sin and shame and cursings that came along with that. And so what a powerful lesson for us to live according to the teaching of God and always do the things God wants us to do. Now in chapter 2 of the book of Judges, we're also going to learn a great deal about the importance 
of God's people remaining separate. That is, that we don't intermix with people of the world and that spiritually speaking especially, we don't let those people influence us. Listen to Judges chapter 2 beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal uh, to Basham and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why? Have you done this? Therefore I said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare to you. And so God tells the people here, you need to be separate. You need to be different. You need to live according to my law and follow my ways and don't, don't intermarry with these heathen people because they're going to drag you away from me. And yet God's people didn't listen and they didn't remain separate. Friend, as we speak to especially Christians today relating to God's people being separate, how this principle is so true when it relates to our spiritual walk and our need to be separate from the world. Listen to God's Word. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6 verses 17 or 16 through 18, God says to us, come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord. I will be your God, you shall be my people. God goes on to say, do not touch what is unclean or unholy. Come out from among them. That's the idea. God doesn't want me. And He doesn't want us, you, to live like everybody else in the world. He wants us to be separate and special and His unique people who are living different, called out and living according to the teaching of His Word. And friend, especially as it relates to Christians. We need to be very careful who we align ourselves with. They have the power. We can inf uh, influence people for good, but we also need to realize that if we make evil people of the world our strongest and closest connections and friends, they also can influence us for evil. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 31 through 33. Paul said, Do not be deceived. Evil companions corrupt good morals. We say to ourselves, well, I'm going to influence them for good, and, and that's a high and lofty goal. But friend, let's also realize if we're not careful, we don't keep our guard up, we can also be influenced by them. This is why Jesus would say in Matthew 5, verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, Throughout the book of Judges, you will also see the admonition of God's people uh, where God tells them not to intermarry with the heathens around them and to make sure that they do the things that are right in God's sight. And so as you'll look through the book of Judges, God will tell them, don't marry these people. Uh, I don't want you to get caught up in what they're doing because if you do that, they're going to draw you away from me. And friend, the same principle again would apply to Christianity. Christians ought to strive to marry other Christians. Christians ought to strive to marry somebody who is going to help them to do what's right and ultimately to get to heaven. You know, when I think about the idea of marrying a Christian, Genesis chapter 2 takes us back to God's ideal plan on marriage. God there said in His law, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God created marriage for us to help one another throughout this life. Genesis 2.18, God saw that it was not good for man to be alone, thus He made him a helper comparable to him. God gave us the beautiful uh, relationship of marriage to help one another get to heaven. And friend, if that's the ultimate design and goal of marriage, and God told His people under the Old Testament, don't marry somebody who's not a Christian, friend, the encouragement for us as well is, why would you want to marry someone? Why would you want your closest ally, your strongest confidant, your greatest 
a human helper in this life to be someone who's not even a Christian, who's not even a part of God's family. Friend, you want to think seriously, young people especially. Think very seriously about who you're going to marry. Make sure that you not just marry, not only marry somebody who's a Christian, but marry a faithful Christian. Somebody who will encourage you to live for the Lord every day. Somebody who will uh, want to worship God together with you. Somebody who will encourage you to read your Bible and to pray and to study and to, to grow as a Christian. Somebody that you can evangelize with. Somebody who will help us. Somebody who's not afraid when we do things that are not right to point out wrong in our life. It may be a rather blunt way of stating it, but an uh, old-time gospel preacher once said of someone who was marrying a non-Christian, he said this, he said, if you marry a child of the devil, you can be sure you're going to have trouble with your father-in-law. And friend, that's exactly right. If I marry someone who's not a Christian, Satan is going to try to be working into my life in every way. And so again, like the people of Israel, we need to make sure that we are our closest friends, especially the person that you marry. Make sure that person's a Christian. I, I know and I understand that there have been people who have married non-Christians and they have converted them to the Lord. And that's good and we're thankful for every person like that. Friend, what about all the people who didn't marry Christians and have now fallen away from the Lord? We need to be very careful that we align ourselves with strong Christian influences, strong Christian mates, and that our homes are strong Christian homes that will bring God the glory and the honor in every way. Now, as you study throughout the book of Judges, we're going to come across a number of these judges who are who we think of as great uh, warriors, and they are. You've got Gideon, you've got Barak, you've got Samson, just a host of these were great uh, warriors and great judges on behalf of God. But many times these people also struggled with their own sin and their own problems. Just like Samson, who is thought of as such a great individual and such a great hero of the faith. Well, Samson had a lot of fathers. For example, look in, or had, had a lot of problems. Look in Judges chapter 14. I want you to see just for example how not only can an a ungodly mate draw one away, but Samson sometimes had his own problems. Look in Judges 14. The Bible says, Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now listen to his gall here. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as wife. You know, one of the things that you can definitely learn from this passage is you need to be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. Samson sees this beautiful woman. She is not a people of Israel. He doesn't care. She's appealed to his physical lust and so he has the gall to say to his parents go get her for me you know this woman as you're well aware with the story of samson probably will be his downfall you need to be careful what you ask for you might just get it samson thought that's what he wanted but when his eyes are poked out and he is in that dungeon i wonder if he thinks differently about this look a little further in judges chapter 14 Verse number three, his parents try to correct him for this. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren among, or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. But his father and mother did not know it was of the Lord. And he was seeking occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. And so it is the case that God could work through Samson, that God could work through even some of his uh, decisions that were not right. 
But Samson is going to have to pay the consequences uh, for that. This woman is eventually going to find out what his strength is, his long hair. She is eventually going to turn him over to the enemies. He's going to be placed in that dungeon. And I know we're well aware of the great event where Samson pushes down the walls and that house falls and, and how all the enemies die. But it didn't have to come to that. Samson's bad choices are what led to that, his passion his desire, his uh, breaking the law of God on many occasions would also lead to his downfall. And no doubt this woman was not an encouragement to him either way. And so Samson might to many be thought of as a great hero and warrior. And in the end, we look at him in that way. But his life was also riddled with a great many problems. Now, there's another practical lesson, though, from the book of Judges that we want to mention. And that is, goes along with the idea of being careful what we ask for, but also, let's be careful what we promise. Judges chapter 11. I want you to look beginning in verse number 29. The Bible says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he advanced toward the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands, then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the people of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon, to fight against them. And the Lord delivered them into his hands. He defeated them from Arior as far as Mineth, 20 cities, and to Abel, Karamim, with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. So God did his part. Now watch verse 34. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you've brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot give it back. And so Jephthah made a rather rash statement and a rather rash promise here. Now, did God want human sacrifice? Of course not. Would God have wanted him to sacrifice his daughter? No. In fact, there are many believe, who believe that Jephthah actually gave his daughter uh, in temple service for the rest of her life. There are some who would say that he actually sacrificed her, but friend, that's not what God would have wanted even though he promised that. But the, but the lesson is this. I need to be very careful what I say. Those words, the things I say, the promises that I make, the vows that I give, they're meant to be kept. And friend, we need to make sure that when we vow or promise something, especially that's according to the will of God, that we follow up on that promise. Now, let's mention a couple of those vows or promises that today are especially important. When I make the decision to become a Christian, I make a commitment and a promise and a vow to live for the Lord each and every day. When I go down into the waters of baptism, come up a, a new creature, I'm walking in newness of life. Friend, I've made a commitment from this day forward. I'm going to live my life for God and give it to Him. Let's make sure that we realize the seriousness of that and that we do our best each and every day to follow through with that. And then, of course, a second vow or promise that so many of us are familiar with are the vows that we make in marriage. When we stand before God and we say that we'll live faithfully unto death to this woman or this man until death parts us, friend, that's a very serious matter. And God holds us to that promise and to that vow. And in a day and age where marriages are began and ending begun and ended so frivolously so flippantly we've got to realize the seriousness of one man and one woman for life death 
being that which ends that union. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. And so to young people especially, don't enter into such a serious commitment without great forethought and without realizing when I marry this person, this is for life. There aren't any do-overs. I need to make a commitment to stay with them until the day we both die, or until one of us dies at least. Now, the final principle that we want to look at from the book of Judges brings us full circle back to the main theme. Flip over in your Bible to Judges chapter 17, and I want you to hear again what is said in verse number 6. The Bible says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Friend, when we think about the downfall of Israel, when we think about these dark days, which are, as you read the book of Judges, are going to get a lot darker. When we think about that dark period in Israel's history, that darkness was caused by them rejecting the true source of light. God is light. John chapter 8, verse 12, God is love. 1 John 4, verse 8, and to overcome the darkness, Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John chapter 8, verse number 12. And so, just as Israel could pull themselves out of this dark period by turning back to God, so men and women today who are living in darkness and sin can come to the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, the Bible says we have fellowship one with another, with one another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. And so today we ask, are our lives being lived according to the will of God? Or are we living in kind of an anarchist mindset where I'm going to have it my way and I'm going to do it my way and nobody can tell me any different? Friend, that lifestyle is not going to lead to happiness and joy and peace. If you're not a Christian, not a child of God, we encourage you to become one today. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when they realized Jesus was Lord and Christ, they cried out, What shall we do? And the answer was clarion. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verses 36 through 38. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to become one today. If as a child of God, maybe your life has gone back into darkness, why not repent and make that right? And let's let each of us give God the first place in our lives so we can glorify and honor Him every day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.